Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today sort of hits close to home. We're going to talk about the spirit of aloha. This is a fascinating topic. I've been in Hawaii now for three and a half years. Steve, you've been here how long now? Six Uh, years? Five or six, in in between those two. And of course, uh, long before that, both of us like you perhaps, had visited Hawaii, and the first thing you notice while you're still on the airplane is they use words like aloha and mahalo, and those are usually the first two Hawaiian words that anybody learns when they come here. Now, mahalo is thank you, that's clear, but aloha has got more than one meaning. It just goes on and on and on, and Steve and I thought we'd do a program today on the spirit of aloha to share with you some of what we've discovered about what is really core mysticism in many ways. There is ancient wisdom in this whole concept of aloha that most tourists would miss if you thought, oh, yeah, that's that word that is really handy. That's like shalom. That's uh, hello and goodbye and I love you and peace and all that kind of stuff. Love and harmony and compassion. Well, why is it all of those things? What's the purview here? What's what's the bigger picture? That's what we mean when we talk about the spirit of aloha. Yeah, we're talking about aloha as being literally the breath that you share with someone. It's a process. I mean, when two old-time Hawaiians come together, they come together, their faces, it's like it's almost like Eskimos with their noses touching. They come right together, and they breathe in each other's breath. They share the breath, and that's a big part of what the, really, the aloha to the Hawaiians are. It's it's sharing, it's proving, really, that we are one, that we are sharing God's breath, that we're all part of the same thing, and it's a very deep and moving experience when two old Hawaiians who haven't seen each other in a long time come together and just stare into each other's eyes and breathe each other's breath. We're talking about a life force, a, a mana, a, a chi, a ki, a prana, a, gosh, in, in New Orleans they call it mojo. It's, it's that which animates. It's, it's the life force. It's the creativity. Some people call it God. It's, it's something very, very special that people share when they use the word aloha. It's not just hello. It's it's you and I are part of this same universe together, and I share the same breath of the world that you share. Now, even though you're hearing those words and you can intellectualize what Steve just said, I'd like to suggest you go a little bit further with this and actually imagine being a person who lives in this beautiful tropical paradise where year-round, every day is springtime. It's just a perfect day. And if it's too hot, you go up country a little bit. And if you're too chilly at night, you come down the hill, head to the beach. It's got, like, very, very dry side, the leeward side, the windward side of each island is extremely wet. And uh, it's just paradise in so many different ways. And you live close to the ground. You live in nature. You're outdoors almost all the time, regardless of the kind of house or shack or ohana, hale, that you may live in. You're outside most of the time. And you're aware of aloha. You're living aloha. It's not just a word or a belief system. You are experiencing the oneness and the sacredness, the pure love and happiness, the joy of every mindful moment of your life. And so when you meet someone, as Steve has said, you know they're feeling the same thing. And if you're in this deep love, this aloha, you can feel their feelings. There's very strong empathy and understanding, of course. That's what's intangible and Difficult to convey when we talk about aloha here today, the spirit of aloha, and how that even translates into a a lifestyle and a worldview. It's difficult to describe how deep this love really is and how moving it is. But when a Hawaiian, a man or a woman, talks about it, usually they come from a place of great humility, kindness, gentleness, and they often tear as right. if they're witnessing something really, really beautiful. So that's what I was thinking, too, as I pictured it in my mind, it, the tears. There's almost always the tears. That are, not all, a lot, there's the tears. You know, to me, 
a big part of it, aloha is the breath, is the sharing of, and it's the smell. I mean, smell is such a significant one of our senses. And, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, lived 50 years in Los Angeles, and I didn't pay much attention to smell except when, like, there wasn't usually much wind. When there was a wind, sometimes you'd smell the smog, and that was not a good, and once in a while you'd walk past a bakery and go, ooh, wow, you know. But generally speaking, I didn't pay much attention to the smell of things. It wasn't a big deal. It hardly ever changed. You got used to it. But in Hawaii, the winds are always wafting, the smell is always changing, and it's never anything but flowers. I mean, it's, it's always different flowers, you know, different wonderful smells. The, the trade winds are blowing these wonderful, wonderful smells. And, and so to me, there's this sense of feeling safe, of feeling free, of feeling healthy, of feeling joyful. There's, there's something that comes in smelling nature, smelling healthy. And, and I think sharing aloha starts on some deep primal level with inhaling, it being inspired as you inspire and, and to feel the safety of maybe the only jungle in the world with virtually nothing dangerous in it, you know, virtually the only most beautiful place and, and the most sheltered place and farther away from anywhere else than anywhere else and the place that people who want to get away from everything come to to get away. This is an amazing unique place. Not to mention how brand new it is. I mean, you know, I mean, even the oldest of the Hawaiian islands are only like 5 million years old and the big island's still being made, you know. So I think there's something about the smell here that led to that primal feeling of safety that allowed for the freedom of being able to move so close to somebody. I mean, to be able to stand right in their energy, right in their space. That's something you don't do in the Western world a whole lot. And to be that close to somebody, to feel safe enough to do that, that's, I think, part of where the Aloha spirit was born. I feel privileged to live here. And we, of course, could do a program about all the problems that have come with Hawaii being Americanized, becoming a state, and so on, about the influence of the military here, agribusiness, and the even current struggle over water, and and the missionaries, too, all of this stuff. But, you know, beyond all of this, to understand aloha is to recognize that the mystical traditions of the world and the esoteric philosophies that have said you know, love is what matters. The way in which you love, your own self-respect, your kindness and consideration for other people, even when they disagree with you, to recognize that people have a freedom to be who they are and express themselves. And yet that freedom includes a recognition of the mutual benefit of working together as a big family, again, it's called an ohana here. Now, that's not just your immediate family. It's beyond the nuclear family, the the extended family. Your ohana is where you live, but it's all of your cousins. And even if it's a guy down the road that you've just known for a while, and they're not even part of your blood family, they could be in your ohana. That's your big group, your tribe, your clan that you that you hang out with, especially in the countryside. And everybody is family. And so aloha is an understanding that the world is a family. And yet it's not even limited to other human beings, all being members of a single family. There are, as is often the case with indigenous peoples, a great profound respect for the animal kingdom. And the, the animals, in many ways, are our brothers and sisters. And then, of course, the plant kingdom and the mineral kingdom, too. <laughs> you have to have respect for the environment. And aloha includes an understanding that every action you take has repercussions generation after generation. Real wisdom, like the indigenous people of the mainland had. So imagine carrying this awareness of the oneness of all things with you out into the world day after day. Could you do that in Los Angeles or New York? Could you do that in the rural areas of the mainland? Could you do that in foreign countries? Well, of course. Aloha doesn't require that you live in Hawaii. Aloha is a word for love, for compassion, forgiveness, for kindness, and humility, and all of the other qualities of love 
that can be practiced anywhere in the world, indeed everywhere in the world. And so, to me, understanding the loha is not merely limited to saving this beautiful culture, although that's a big part of it for us, because we're privileged to be able to live here. But also to spread the idea of aloha through song and dance and programs like this. And if you've ever been here and heard the word or even used the word, consider these larger meanings. These somewhat religious but rather mystical or philosophical ideas that love is the golden thread that runs through awareness studies and consciousness and you know, the conclusion of so many philosophers about reality that what it really comes down to is love. It does. And, you know, in its many forms, including the one you were talking a bit about uh, respect, you know, respecting the animal kingdom, respecting the mineral kingdom. You know, to me, the really most powerful impact that the Aloha spirit had on me in moving here was the uh, inherent respect the culture has for old people. That's something I didn't see in the. I saw old people getting thrown into homes, you know. And I mean, around here, it's it's aunties and uncles, and if you're old enough to be one, you are one, and and they look up to and respect and listen to the wisdom of the old people and take care of them and and really are very kind to them. When when I came over here shortly after a year or two after I moved here, I brought my mom over to live over here and she was in her late 80s she was definitely a older person um and everybody tutu yeah tutu uh, auntie and everybody treated her like with such respect and with such kindness and with such um almost like wanting to sit at the foot of and look up in the, with adoring eyes at you know this old person who who has wisdom who who can share stories of of old things that happened and how the world once was and it's it was it's just so loving uh, the way we treat old people over here you know i i've always been tremendously uh, admired the way the hawaiian people did that and and i think i modeled that i i attempted to do that too to to treat my mom in in the way that hawaiians treat moms instead of the way that you know that californians treat their moms i think i i, I made a, a huge shift in my in my consciousness and, and wanted to do it in that more hawaiian kind of way so yeah there's lots of ways that that aloha is special and aloha is unique and different but as michael said it's not it's not just limited to hawaii although it's always associated with hawaii you can have it anywhere i remember my first experience of aloha was elvis presley coming to hawaii you know i mean and like wow i want to go there and you know dance and sing and be in with all those hula girls and stuff so yeah it's, it's something i felt aloha spirit you know back when i was a teenager wanting to go to hawaii and be with elvis presley and right after that, of course, the Beach Boys started singing about Hawaii, and there were instrumental surf songs like Pipeline about the North Shore of Oahu, and Jaws became very famous here off the North Shore of Maui. The surfing culture is not only hot in Southern California, but now we have windsurfing and kiteboarding, and a lot of that was born right here with the old longboard guys, most of them Hawaiians. And another interesting concept about aloha, I think, that the island lends itself to is this idea of time being basically, well, let's call it a mindful approach to life, where time doesn't have the past and future emphasis that it does in the mainland. People think of uh, time in most places of the world, I suppose, especially the industrialized urban areas as a line with a past and a present and a future, and you put your mind in the past or the future, and every once in a while in the present, if you have to pay attention, but for the most part, the mind is off in the past or worried about the future. You're much more likely to be here now in a place like Hawaii. And so this is part of the Hawaiian culture. You know, in Spanish, there's the word uh, manana, like maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Well, the pidgin word in Hawaiian is bambai, which means maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. You know, there's a good chance I'm not going to do that at all. I don't know, bambai. 
And uh, it's kind of like I'll decide as time goes by. Yeah, it's pigeon for by and by. Yeah, the by and by. One of these days, maybe. But it's not about being lazy. It's about, dude. Why are you stressing about tomorrow? What, it's about surfs up, man. Yeah. <laughs> or or everything's just fine sitting here on the beach under the coconut tree. And the breezes, I mean, where would you need to go to improve upon this? And so that becomes part of the culture. Now, again, Eckhart Tolle has done very well in terms of promoting Buddhism without saying, hey, this is fundamental Buddhist philosophy in in yoga, in Eastern wisdom, the power of now. Well, indigenous people from all over the world have lived in the now, mindfully. They understand that concept and do not have nearly the level of stress and anxiety as people on the mainland who seem to do everything that we can to avoid being in the now. Obsessing on the past, on our regrets and our resentments, and I wish I would have, could have, and concern that we're going to repeat those mistakes in the future. Often we don't pay attention to what's happening right in front of us. We miss the now, the only thing that's real, and that's clearly part of aloha, that eternity is found in this unfolding moment. You know, part of what Aloha is about is sharing this moment, being in the present moment with each other. And and uh, so much of Aloha is about the now, the here. And as Michael was saying, it's it may be easier to be here and now, here and now in, in Maui, but you can be in the Aloha spirit wherever you are. It's a state of mind. It starts, I think, with feeling safe. You know, there's something about being on an island that makes you feel I mean, it's true, John Dunn said, no man is an island, but being on an island creates some kind of like, all those wars are really far away, you know, I mean, like, all that bad stuff, all that mugging and all that, like, it feels to me like that's really far away from me, and of course, I live in a very remote part of this island, so it, it there's something about that that makes us feel different. Now, you know, people think of Hawaii back before America took it over as being this, like, backwater place like Africa it was before, you know in the 1800s no Hawaii was a very sophisticated culture and, and more people actually were literate than any other culture in the world at that time and they had ambassadors in other countries i mean it was a big deal country you know before we came and essentially took it over but i think the aloha spirit which has survived probably was much much more prevalent back before you know the westernization the the uh taking over of the agricultural business the you know the, the annexation of this island the stealing in a way of this island on some level just like we did with the north american continent from the indians you know and they did from the polar bears or whoever lived there in the ice age i don't know it always you know one people supplant the next but but the aloha spirit has refused to die as much as we've tried to westernize this place and yes spam is very popular here the aloha spirit hangs on tenaciously yeah you have to explain that you're talking about a meat product that comes in a can not email oh yes yes the old yeah (laughs) you know the the stuff that that world war ii made famous you know it became the thing that ships are you know off the subject but the can of spam on the side of it it says the the use by date it's like indefinitely (laughs) the shelf about the shelf time is indefinitely well i think that's the deal with canned meat (laughs) Hawaiian uh, culture is interesting because in many ways it is a polyglot. Uh, The ukulele comes from Portugal. The guitar comes from Spain by way of Mexican vaqueros who came over to manage cattle decades before there was a wild west in America before cattle ranches and cowboys out west. The Polynesians, the Tahitians who came here first, they had no idea how to do that. Yeah, 1820s and 1830s, the king of Hawaii brought vaqueros from Mexico to teach them how to manage the cattle that had been given to them earlier. And they just got out of control because it's such perfect condition for grazing here. Happy cows. The whalers then came, and they brought their influences of a lot of the Portuguese or Portuguese, and uh, the same with the animals and the plants. Much of it washed up on the shore of these volcanoes and took root. This pine cone or this seed pod, 
or a bird would get lost in a hurricane and end up out here and found another one like it and began to breed and after a few hundred thousand years they became specific to that particular island a species unlike any found anywhere else in the world as it continues to evolve and so with many of the plants and then there are those that were brought in by missionaries and others like the goats and the pigs which have devastated the islands in many ways but the people of Hawaii were also devastated by smallpox and venereal disease and even the common cold that was brought here by European explorers. And so to talk about the Hawaiian culture as if it's one thing is impossible. And yet there is one thing that unifies it all. And it's a word that means the one thing, right? Aloha. The breath of God. This is the breath that in Genesis, Moses talks about God breathing into the nostrils of Adam. And he gathers up this clay and then breathes. It's the breath of God. As Steve said, the prana, the chi or ki, the the kundalini, the alan vital, a religious person might call this Holy Spirit. But that's the ha, that's the energy And yet the word also means joy and sharing. Well, of course you're going to share joy, love, the one energy, if there's just one thing at work. Or as the metaphysician often says, there's only one of us here after all. All of this exists within the concept of God as one thing. Now, this is mind-blowing, or at least challenging to most people in the West, whether they be Christian, Jew, Muslim, or any other. They tend to think of the Creator as separate from its creation, that God lives out on the edge somehow, very far away, and is not really available. Now, religions may say God is everywhere, But the idea of God being in all things is a little too pantheistic for the Catholics and for most of the Protestants. And I don't think Jews generally care one way or the other. And I think the Muslims are mixed on this issue also. Pantheism, sometimes called paganism, is the idea that everything is sacred. So it's totally up to you. I'm not telling you what to think or the right way to believe. Our job, I think, is just to point out that you have choices that you might not have otherwise considered. The idea that God is separate and stands outside its creation very far away, or that there's just one thing at work here. And the sharing is inherent because although you are in a separate body, in a world of separated forms, If I feel connected to this one thing, then obviously I'm going to feel connected to you. That's a quality of love, of inclusiveness that goes beyond romance. And so, you know, in that way, Aloha Spirit isn't a product of being in Hawaii. Aloha Spirit is a choice. It's a way of choosing to live your life. In fact, another word for it would be perception. That, that aloha spirit is what stands between the stimulus and the response. Like stuff happens, but if you have this aloha spirit, you see it as we're all one, we're all together. I come from a place of peace and harmony. I look for solutions rather than problems. You know, if you have a, an aloha spirit about you, then what comes in as stimulus, some of which you have some control over, much of which, as Michael often says, blindsides you, but... You always can choose to perceive it through the Aloha Spirit, to to see it through this place of feeling safe, of feeling love, of feeling part of the whole. And and with that as a overriding spirit, just like I suppose religion is for a lot of people, it's the perception through which they see the whole world that comes through those doors of perception, as Huxley called them. Well, I think Aloha Spirit is a wonderful door of perception to have, to, to face the world with, and Yes, it's easier to do here on Maui than it is to do probably in even Honolulu, and it's probably easier in Honolulu than it is in New York City, but it's doable. It's a it's a spirit that you can have. It's a lifestyle that you can adopt. It it starts with, I think, feeling safe, 
uh, starts with the breath. It starts with getting that sense of being part of the whole, part of the one. It starts with living in the now. It starts with getting out of stress, spending more and more time in the place we call paradise, which really is fraught with the aloha spirit. Uh, it's the alpha brainwave state. It's the state of focused passion. It's total focused concentration, amplified passionate interest. It's just the zone, the flow. It's paying attention to one thing. It's a wonderful, peaceful place where you can say hello to yourself and goodbye to your problems. It's it's as aloha as you can get. It's it's a place we call paradise. The alpha brainwave level is what brain researchers call it, and sometimes we use Steve's term narrow awake, which I really like. And uh, focused passion, of course, is where you come for these programs. These are all references to the place between awake and asleep, uh, where there is the greatest love and the least fear permitted to reside in the presence of all that love. You see, if everything is one, if we're all connected or all manifestations of a single thing, the one life, the one thing is what the ancient Egyptians used to call it, then there is nothing that opposes you. Nothing is threatening you. Now, you can say that's naive, and I will be the first to admit there certainly is an appearance of opposition, of threats, of terror. Many people and institutions routinely study new and better ways of using fear to divide us and then play one against the other. Well, that's obviously the antithesis of what we're talking about. Aloha is that harmonizing and even unifying force. It is a sense of oneness that allows for diversity within it. Hawaiians might say about a difference, all from the same rainbow. You understand? They understand that there are these many colors, but you combine them, you get sunshine, you get white light. And yet, both things are true. This is a big problem for Westerners in general. What do you mean, both things are true? I thought we lived in an absolute world. Things were either true or they're not true. Well, but again, indigenous people who live close to the earth, people who have a rather mystical, spiritual view of things being connected, are much more likely to see the relative truth in things, that everything is true to some degree. This is a very big truth, and to a large degree is true, maybe 99% of it. But there's that 1%. There are aberrations. There are other situations. There are some who disagree on this. And then other things will be 50-50 or 60-40. Your truth may be different than my truth. Well, now, this is frightening to a lot of people, especially those who live with a worldview that everything that appears to be separate really is separate. And if anything is different, then it must be in opposition and therefore a threat. And that fear stimulates the amygdala, fight-or-flight response. Now you see what appears to be separate is even more separate and even more adversarial. <sighs> Don't you see? When you breathe, you breathe not only air, you breathe the life force, the breath of God. When you understand that that's part of one thing, that nothing exists outside of this divinity. You begin to relax and see, if not the unity, at least the harmony. Yeah, we're different, but we can get along. Oh, I like to fish, and you like to play guitar, so if I give you fish, would you teach me how to play guitar? You see? Like, we're different, but I'd like to learn from you. That's a very progressive view to see people who are different, not as a threat, but as a resource that we can draw upon. And this is at the core of civilization, and yet this may be going the way. We may be losing this sense of harmony if more people don't begin to consider these kinds of concepts brought up, in this case, by this beautiful word, aloha. So uh, let's use uh, this beautiful word to do a meditation, an aloha meditation, a mindfulness aloha meditation to 
feel the spirit of aloha throughout you. And it starts by closing your eyes and taking a deep breath or two or three or four and imagining yourself in a paradise, perhaps a place like Hawaii, perhaps Hawaii, perhaps a place of paradise that you've invented in your own mind, but a place that has that potential for safety and beauty that is inherent in the concept of a paradise. And as you continue to breathe consciously for a few moments, you begin to feel the stress release, that is, the tension in your body does float away, and anxiety levels, they fade. Confusion seems to be left behind from your mind. And you find some peace. There's a lot of quiet coming on. The mind's slowing down. Can you hear it? That quiet inside? From that quiet will come the aloha spirit. Wherever you may live, imagine yourself for just a moment being in a big city like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. And you're walking down the street, unless it's L.A. Nobody walks in L.A. So maybe you're in traffic on a freeway. Or you go to a mall and you're encountering people. You're rubbing shoulders. Feel how it feels to be surrounded by people you do not know. In a big, big city where there's hardly anybody here that you've ever even met before, whether you actually live in a big city or not. Just imagine that. and Move your awareness into your body. And feel the part of you that feels sort of on guard, that's decided to be conscious of where your wallet is or how you carry your purse. Indeed, maybe you even carry your keys in your hands because you want to be careful. And you're watching, you're looking around because you never know what's going to happen. And then imagine that very same situation and the feeling you're just pretending and making all of this up is exactly right. Go ahead. And just pretend that everybody here practiced aloha. And imagine that everybody's understanding of religion, spirituality, philosophy, their ethics and values as human beings tends toward harmony and peace and love. And that everywhere you look, people are smiling for no particular reason. And you feel this incredible sense that you're safe. Even though you don't know these people, you feel loved by these people. And even if you don't feel loved, you feel respected by these people as if there's something you share. It's like motorcyclists who pass each other on the freeway have no idea who that other guy is, but they wave at each other because they share the hobby of riding big motorcycles out on the freeway. And sometimes people do that in car clubs. If they drive the same old classic car, they'll go to rallies to meet people they don't know because they share that interest. It could be anything, stamp collecting. You have a bond, a connection. I'd like you to imagine walking through this mall or down this crowded street that you feel that connection now for every single person that you see. As if you knew them, 
and trusted them and respected them as if they felt that same way about you. You're not a fool. You're not naive. You're willing to consider how would it feel? And could I feel that anyway and give that away? No matter what I got back, most people would probably never understand how it feels right now for you to effortlessly radiate that love, that connection, that bond, that sense of kinship, that we're all in this together. We all have similar problems, and we want the same things. We want love. We want to be comforted. We want to feel safe. We want hugs. We want our kids to be happy. We want to share happiness and joy with our friends and family. Instead of waiting for the world to change, begin to offer that to the world. Pretend. Imagine how it feels to carry gently the spirit of aloha. It's not about letting barriers down and letting anybody in. No, the place with aloha spirit that you want to begin is with strangers. Where there isn't any danger, you can allow the aloha spirit to come through your eyes and just realize that these are people just like you. You may never meet them. You don't need to. It's just knowing that they're part of the whole that is all of us and feel the respect and feel the trust. Innocent and free. The Aloha Spirit allows you to be safe with everybody. So it's not about being naive and letting people in. It's about just putting this out as a way to begin. Just treat people who are of no danger, people who are strangers, with the spirit of aloha. And you'll find that you get back all kinds of smiles, you get back wonderful looks, and it won't all be in your mind. It'll be true. You'll see it come back to you in you from your smile and from your breath and from your eyes. Other people will feel that. Other people might even heal with that and other people will realize that this is a nice way to be. The Aloha Spirit sets their spirit free. The feeling that you're feeling as you imagine loving from such a kind and humble place is an energy you can bring with you into the world at any point. And as you do, you're understanding that now is the only thing that's real. You'll find that you have so much more time in your life. Unhurried by fears that the future is coming at you too fast. feeling safe and relaxed as you realize the past is over and done and can't really hurt you, could only teach you if you choose to go there and learn. You find yourself able, more consciously, mindfully, to be aware of this moment and how you feel right now. Less the thought or feeling that's moving through your mind and heart than the one who is aware, knowing that thoughts are part of a train of thinking or a stream of consciousness, knowing the feelings in the same way will continue to unfold. You remain single-pointed, balanced, peaceful, in your observation 
of thought and feeling and the world around you, the people who are in it, the gentle breezes blowing through your hair, the warmth of the sun on your face and your arms. Feel the breath coming in through the nostrils, and as you exhale, ah, feel the release of love and peace. And with that feeling of love and peace, clear, feels a lot like that aloha spirit deep in here. Become aware of where you are in time and space. Reorient yourself to this right now place and take a deep breath and bring yourself back to wide awake, back to the here and now, back to this place that you find yourself in today. You know, I was thinking uh, the interesting thing about Aloha Spirit is it's not really about being in Hawaii. It's not about latitude. It's about attitude. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, very nice. The uh, Aloha Spirit is another word for spirit itself, for the quality of soul and consciousness known as love when it's capitalized and somehow stands above emotional love, as beautiful as emotional love is. It has its ebb and its flow. It has its heartbreak as well as its presence. It's changing all the time, and yet spiritual love, it does not diminish. It doesn't change. It's still. It's law. It's a it's a presence that, again, religious people experience as divine, and spiritual people, well, wherever you fall, <laughs> whatever that is to you, usually it has to do with a sense of some sort of energy that connects all things. We've seen it in the environment as we understand the ecosystem and how it works together as a single life support system, though it has many diverse elements. What appears to be adversity close up, we often recognize as harmony once we zoom out and see the bigger picture. Hope you'll take some of these ideas to heart as you reflect upon this program and maybe even share this program with somebody that you know who would really like to hear it. Use the Send One to a Friend gadget at FocusedPassion.com. It's right below the player. I just had an email from a guy, I guess you, you forwarded it on to me, about who wanted to learn about the speed reading stuff. So, you know, rather than making any big deal out of it, I just went to the Send One to the Friend thing and sent the, uh, the first of the four episodes of the Family Learning Hour, the one on speed reading. I just sent it right to him. So if you're interested in, in that or anything else, we've got what, almost 200 different topics now uh, that we've talked about, all of them unique, special applications of this focused passion state, this uh, finding yourself in paradise. So whatever it is you're interested in, if it's uh, problem-solving, decision-making, or success, or dealing with uh, other people, that's one of my favorite shows, dealing with difficult people. We've got lots of stuff there for you to take a look at, or more accurately, a listen to. Thanks for being with us. Have a wonderful week and join us next week for our next episode of Finding Yourself in Paradise. Visit FocusPassion.com whenever you get a chance. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui.